Hello, everybody. Welcome to a particularly late night Purblind Gamer stream. I hope all of you chaps are having a good weekend so far. Mine's been moderately stressful. Not too bad, really. We're dealing with changes to our living arrangement here at our place. Which looks like it's all going to work out fine, but still, I find change to be stressful. So, yeah, we're focusing on that and moving a bunch of stuff this afternoon. And then me and my roommates got to go see a crime thriller on 35mm, so that was kind of dope. <clears throat> but it did occur to me, I'm not sure how much the change in living arrangements may impact my ability to stream late at night. I don't know. I mean, I tend, and I try to be pretty quiet late at night anyway. Even though, hmm. yeah, just because if I'm raging at some, you know, action game, worried I might accidentally wake up my roommates, even though we all have our own rooms. Yeah, but we'll see. So I thought tonight would be a good night to do a stream since I didn't do short horror Saturday today, and I had been promising I would read more of The Circular Staircase. And I think the audiobook streams are good for doing late at night, unless, of course, when I'm tired, I stumble over the words more. Conceivable. <clears throat> Thank you to everybody who came out to my last couple of streams. Um, what do we do? Oh yeah, on Wednesday we played Leather Goddesses of Phobos. Made some progress. Not sure how I'm going to get past that next puzzle. And on Sunday we played more of Blackwell Deception. Took a went in one or two directions I did not expect. But I guess those games always do, and that's good. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe I'll try and do a makeup short horror stream this week, depending on how things go, whether I have time. Mm -hmm. but I also figure it's, yeah, you know, audiobook stream is a good thing to do late at night, because I know... Not as much people watch those live necessarily. They tend to watch more, um, watch them more as vods. <clears throat> so I believe we had finished chapter. I bookmarked the wrong page. <clears throat> We'd finished chapter eight, and <clears throat> we had just gotten to the point. Oh yeah, my pleasure, Dragon of the West. Appreciate your being here. Good job working through Cuphead. <laughs> mm. Yeah, and uh, the way I do these is the audiobook stream is once I start reading, I don't really respond to chat. Um, while I'm reading, like I will do it at the end of each chapter, mm. the catch up. Yeah, so I can focus on reading uh, continuously, and yeah, I figure that's the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. In this uh, nineteen oh eight murder mystery, we um got there's I can't really summarize it because there's so much going on, but basically at this house, um, this uh older spinster. It was in, um, as in, uh, was given to her uh, to raise her uh, niece and nephew, who are now grown up, has uh, taken out this house in the country for their holiday, and the first, uh, or one of the first nights there, a dead body shows up, and yeah, they've discovered the identity, and there are a bunch of little, uh, smaller mysteries about you know, 
a mysterious person who was seen late at night, and someone who got into the house and then fell down the clothes chute and managed to escape from a room they thought was locked. And, yeah, Miss Innes's, uh nephew Halsey has been missing and as such is considered one of the suspects. And the part we ended last night, was, or last stream, was right where Halsey finally returned. So yeah. And there's also this police detective on the case, and uh, Miss Innes is not always good about revealing information that might incriminate uh, people she cares about to the detective. <clears throat> <clears throat> How do I always seem to get twice as congested right before I start an audiobook stream? <clears throat> I blame the air. <clears throat> yeah. The Circular Staircase by Mary Reinhardt Roberts. <clears throat> Chapter 9 Just Like a Girl. And Ray. Halsey said from the gloom behind the lamps. What in the world are you doing here? Taking a walk, I said, trying to be composed. I don't think the answer struck either of us as being ridiculous at the time. Oh, Halsey, where have you been? Let me take you up to the house. He was in the road and had Beulah and the basket out of my arms in a moment. I could see the car plainly now, and Warner was at the wheel. Warner in an ulster and a pair of slippers over heaven knows what. Jack Bailey was not there. I got in, and we went slowly and painfully up to the house. We did not talk. What we had to say was too important to commence there, and besides, it took all kinds of coaxing from both men to get the dragonfly up the last grade. Only when we had closed the front door and stood facing each other in the hall did Halsey say anything. He slipped his strong young arm around my shoulders and turned me so I faced the light. Poor Aunt Ray, he said gently, and I nearly wept again. I, I must see Gertrude, too. We will have a three-cornered talk. And then Gertrude herself came down the stairs. She had not been to bed, evidently. She still wore the white negligee she had worn earlier in the evening, and she limped somewhat. During her slow progress down the stairs, I had time to notice one thing. Mr. Jamieson had said the woman who escaped from the cellar had worn no shoe on her right foot. Gertrude's right ankle was the one she had sprained. The meeting between brother and sister was tense, but without tears. Halsey kissed her tenderly, and I noticed evidences of strain and anxiety in both young faces. Is everything right? she asked. Right as can be, with forced cheerfulness. I lighted the living room, and we went in there. Only a half hour before, I had sat with Mr. Jamieson in that very room, listening while he overtly accused both Gertrude and Halsey of at least a knowledge of the death of Arnold Armstrong. Now Halsey was here to speak for himself. I should learn everything that had puzzled me. I saw it in the paper tonight for the first time, he was saying. It knocked me dumb. When I think of this house full of women, and a thing like that occurring. Gertrude's face was set and white. That isn't all, Halsey, she said. You and, and Jack left almost at the time it happened. The detective here thinks that you, that we, know something about it. The devil he does! Halsey's eyes were fairly starting from his head. I beg your pardon, Aunt Ray, but... The fellow's a lunatic. Tell me everything, won't you, Halsey? I begged. 
tell me where you were that night, or rather morning, and why you went out as you did. This has been a terrible forty-eight hours for all of us. He stood staring at me, and I could see the horror of the situation dawning in his face. I can't tell you where I went, Aunt Ray, he said after a moment. As to why, you will learn that soon enough. But Gertrude knows that Jack and I left the house before this thing, this horrible murder, occurred. Mr. Jamieson does not believe me, Gertrude said drearily. Halsey, if the worst comes, if they should arrest you, you must tell. I shall tell nothing, he said, with a new sternness in his voice. Aunt Ray, it was necessary for Jack and me to leave that night. I cannot tell you why, just yet. As to where we went, if I have to depend on that as an alibi, I shall not tell. The whole thing is an absurdity, a trumped-up charge that cannot possibly be serious. Has Mr. Bailey gone back to the city, I demanded, or to the club? Neither, defiantly. At the present moment, I do not know where he is. Halsey, I asked gravely, leaning forward. Have you the slightest suspicion who killed Arnold Armstrong? The police think he was admitted from within, and that he was shot down from above by someone on the circular staircase. I know nothing of it, he maintained, but I fancied I caught a sudden glance at Gertrude, a flash of something that died as it came. As quietly, as calmly as I could, I went over the whole story. From the night Liddy and I had been alone, up to the strange experience of Rosie and her pursuer. The basket still stood on the table, a mute witness to this last mystifying occurrence. There's something else, I said hesitatingly, at the last. Halsey, I have never told this even to Gertrude, but the morning after the crime I found, in a tulip bed, a revolver. It, it was yours, Halsey. For an appreciable moment, Halsey stared at me. Then he turned to Gertrude. My revolver, Trude, he exclaimed. Why, Jack took my revolver with him, didn't he? Oh, for heaven's sake, don't say that, I implored. The detective thinks possibly Jack Bailey came back and... And the thing happened then. He didn't come back, Halsey said sternly. Gertrude, when you brought down a revolver that night for Jack to take with him, what one did you bring? Mine? Gertrude was defiant now. No, yours was loaded, and I was afraid of what Jack might do. I gave him one that I have had for a year or two. It was empty. Halsey threw up both hands despairingly. If that isn't like a girl, he said, why didn't you do what I asked you to, Gertrude? You send Bailey off with an empty gun and throw mine in a tulip bed of all places on earth. Mine was a thirty-eight caliber. The inquest will show, of course, that the bullet that killed Armstrong was a thirty-eight. Then where shall I be? You forget... I broke in, that I have the revolver, and that no one knows about it. But Gertrude had risen angrily. I cannot stand it. It is always with me, she cried. Halsey, I did not throw your revolver into the tulip bed. I think you did it yourself. They stared at each other across the big library table, with young eyes all at once hard and suspicious. And then Gertrude held out both hands to him appealingly. We must not, she said brokenly. Just now, with so much at stake, it is shameful. I know you are it's as ignorant as I am. Make me believe it, Halsey. Halsey soothed her as best he could, and the breach seemed healed. But long after I went to bed, he sat downstairs in the living room alone, 
and I knew he was going over the case as he had learned it. Some things were clear to him that were dark to me. He knew, and Gertrude too, why Jack Bailey and he had gone away that night as they did. He knew where they had been for the last forty-eight hours, and why Jack Bailey had not returned with him. It seemed to me that without fuller confidence from both the children, they were always children to me, I should never be able to learn anything. As I was finally getting ready for bed, Halsey came upstairs and knocked at my door. When I had got into a negligee, I used to say wrapper before Gertrude came back from school, I let him in. He stood in the doorway a moment, and then he went into agonies of silent mirth. I sat down on the side of the bed and waited in severe silence for him to stop, but he only seemed to grow worse. When he had recovered, he took me by the elbow and pulled me in front of the mirror. How to be beautiful, he quoted, advice to maids and matrons, by Beatrice Fairfax. And then I saw myself. I had neglected to remove my wrinkle eradicators, and I presume my appearance was odd. I believe that it is a woman's duty to care for her looks. But it is much like telling a necessary falsehood. One must not be found out. By the time I got them off, Halsey was serious again, and I listened to his story. Aunt Ray, he began, extinguishing his cigarette on the back of my ivory hairbrush, I would give a lot to tell you the whole thing, but I can't, for a day or so, anyhow. But one thing I might have told you a long time ago. If you had known it, you would not have suspected me for a moment of, of anything to do with the attack on Arnold Armstrong. Goodness knows what I might do to a fellow like that if there was enough provocation and I had a gun in my hand under ordinary circumstances. But I care a great deal about Louise Armstrong, Aunt Ray. I hope to marry her some day. Is it likely I would kill her brother? Her stepbrother, I corrected. No, of course it isn't likely. Or possible. Why didn't you tell me, Halsey? Well, there are two reasons, he said slowly. One was that you had a girl already picked out for me. Nonsense, I broke in, and felt myself growing red. I had, indeed, one of the... but no matter. And the second reason, he pursued, was that the Armstrongs would have none of me. I sat bolt upright at that and gasped. The Armstrongs, I repeated, with old Peter Armstrong driving a stage across the mountains while your grandfather was a war governor. Well, of course, the war governor's dead and out of the matrimonial market, Halsey interrupted, and the present Innes admits himself he isn't good enough for, for Louise. Exactly, I said despairingly, and, of course, you are taken at your own valuation. The Innesses are not always so self-deprecatory. Not always, no, he said, looking at me with his boyish smile. Fortunately, Louise doesn't agree with her family. She's willing to take me, war governor or no, provided her mother consents. She isn't overly fond of her stepfather, but she adores her mother. And now... Can't you see where this thing puts me? Down and out, with all of them. But the whole thing is absurd, I argued. And besides, Gertrude's sworn statement that you left before Arnold Armstrong came would clear you at once. Halsey got up and began to pace the room, and the air of cheerfulness dropped like a mask. She can't swear it, he said, finally. Gertrude's story was true as far as it went, but she didn't tell everything. Arnold Armstrong came here at 2.30, came into the billiard room, and left in five minutes. He came to bring... something. Halsey, I cried, you must tell me the whole truth. Every time I see a way for you to escape, you block it yourself with this wall of mystery. What did he bring? A telegram for Bailey, he said. 
It came by special messenger from town, and was most important. Bailey had started for here, and the messenger had gone back to the city. The steward gave it to Arnold, who had been drinking all day and couldn't sleep, and was going for a stroll in the direction of Sunnyside. And he brought it? Yes. What was in the telegram? I can tell you, as soon as certain things are made public. It is only a matter of days now, gloomily. And Gertrude's story of a telephone message? Poor Trude, he half whispered. Poor loyal little girl. Aunt Ray, there was no such message. No doubt your detective already knows that, and discredits all Gertrude told him. And when she went back, it was to get the telegram? Probably, Halsey said slowly. When you get to thinking about it, Aunt Ray, it looks bad for all three of us, doesn't it? And yet, I will take my oath, none of us ever inadvertently killed that poor devil. I looked at the closed door into Gertrude's dressing room and lowered my voice. The same horrible thought keeps recurring to me, I whispered. Halsey, Gertrude probably had your revolver. She must have examined it, anyhow, that night. After you and Jack had gone, what if that ruffian came back, and she, and she... I couldn't finish. Halsey stood looking at me with shut lips. She might have heard him fumbling at the door. He had no key, the police say, and thinking it was you. Or Jack, she admitted him. When she saw her mistake, she ran up the stairs, a step or two, and turning like an animal at bay, she fired. Halsey had his hand over my lips before I finished, and in that position we stared at each other, we stared at each other, our stricken glances crossing. The revolver, my revolver, thrown into the tulip bed, he muttered to himself, thrown perhaps from an upper window. You say it was buried deep, her prostration ever since, her... Aunt Ray, you don't think it was Gertrude who fell down the clothes chute? I could only nod my head in a hopeless affirmative. Chapter 10. The Trader's Bank The morning after Halsey's return was Tuesday. Arnold Armstrong had been found dead at the foot of the circular staircase at three o'clock on Sunday morning. The funeral services were to be held on Tuesday, and the interment of the body was to be deferred until the Armstrongs arrived from California. No one, I think, was very sorry that Arnold Armstrong was dead, but the manner of his death aroused some sympathy and an enormous amount of curiosity. Mrs. Ogden Fitzhugh, a cousin, took charge of the arrangements, and everything, I believe, was as quiet as possible. I gave Thomas Johnson and Mrs. Watson permission to go into town to pay their last respects to the dead man, but for some reason they did not care to go. Halsey spent part of the day with Mr. Jamieson, but he said nothing of what happened. He looked grave and anxious, and he had a long conversation with Gertrude late in the afternoon. Tuesday evening found us quiet, with the quiet that precedes an explosion. Gertrude and Halsey were both gloomy and distraught, and as Liddy had already discovered that some of the china was broken, it is impossible to keep any secrets from an old servant, I was not in a pleasant humor myself. Warner brought up the afternoon mail and the evening papers at seven. I was curious to know what the papers said of the murder. We had turned away at least a dozen reporters. But I read over the headline that ran halfway across the top of the Gazette twice before I comprehended it. Halsey had opened the Chronicle and was staring at it fixedly. The Trader's Bank closes its doors, was what I read, and then I put down the paper and looked across the table. Did you know of this? I asked Halsey. I expected, but not so soon. He replied, and you, 
to Gertrude. Jack told us something, Gertrude said faintly. Oh, Halsey, what can he do now? Jack, I said scornfully, your Jack's flight is easy enough to explain now. And you helped him, both of you, to get away. You get that from your mother. It isn't an innocent trait. Do you know that every dollar you have, both of you, is in that bank? Gertrude tried to speak, but Halsey stopped her. That isn't all, Gertrude, he said quietly. Jack is under arrest. Under arrest, Gertrude screamed and tore the paper out of his hand. She glanced at the heading, then crumpled the newspaper into a ball and flung it to the floor, while Halsey, looking stricken and white, was trying to smooth it out and read it. Gertrude had dropped her head to the table and was sobbing stormily. I have the clipping somewhere, but just now I can only remember the essentials. On the afternoon before, Monday, while the trader's bank was in the rush of closing hour, between two and three, Mr. Jacob Troutman, president of the Pearl Brewing Company, came into the bank to lift a loan. As security for the loan, he had deposited some three hundred international steamship Company Fives, in total value three hundred thousand dollars. Mr. Troutman went to the loan clerk, and, after certain formalities had been gone through, the loan clerk went to the vault. Mr. Troutman, who was a large and genial German, waited for a time, whistling under his breath. The loan clerk did not come back. After an interval, Mr. Troutman saw the loan clerk emerge from the vault and go to the assistant cashier. The two went hurriedly to the vault. A lapse of another ten minutes, and the assistant cashier came out and approached Mr. Troutman. He was noticeably white and trembling. Mr. Troutman was told that, through an oversight, the bonds had been misplaced, and was asked to return the following morning, when everything would be made all right. Mr. Troutman, however, was a shrewd businessman, and he did not like the appearance of things. He left the bank apparently satisfied, and within thirty minutes he had called up three different members of the trader's board of directors. At three-thirty there was a hastily convened board meeting with some stormy scenes, and late in the afternoon a national bank examiner was in possession of the books. The bank had not opened for business on Tuesday. <clears throat> At twelve-thirty o'clock the Saturday before, as soon as the business of the day was closed, Mr. John Bailey, the cashier of the defunct bank, had taken his hat and departed. During the afternoon he had called up Mr. Aronson, a member of the board, and said he was ill and might not be at the bank for a day or two. As Bailey was highly thought of, Mr. Aronson merely expressed a regret. From that time until Monday night, when Mr. Bailey had surrendered to the police, little was known of his movements. Some time after one on Saturday, he had entered the Western Union office at Cherry and White Streets, and had sent two telegrams. He was at the Greenwood Country Club on Saturday night, and appeared unlike himself. It was reported that he would be released under enormous bond some time that day, Tuesday. The article closed by saying that while the officers of the bank refused to talk until the examiner had finished his work, it was known that securities aggregating a million and a quarter were missing. Then there was a diatribe on the possibility of such an occurrence, on the folly of a one-man bank, and of a board of directors that met only to lunch together and to listen to a brief report from the cashier, and on the poor policy of a government that arranges a three- or four-day examination twice a year. The mystery, it insinuated, had not been cleared by the arrest of the cashier. 
Before now, minor officials had been used to cloak the misdeeds of men higher up. Inseparable as the words speculation and peculation had grown to be, John Bailey was not known to be in the stock market. His only words, after his surrender, had been, "'Send for Mr. Armstrong at once.' The telegraph message, which had finally reached the president of the Traders' Bank in an inferior town in California, had been re responded to by a telegram from Dr. Walker, the young physician who was traveling with the Armstrong family, saying that Paul, Paul Armstrong was very ill and unable to travel. That was how things stood that Tuesday evening. The Traders' Bank had suspended payment, and John Bailey was under arrest, charged with wrecking it. Paul Armstrong lay very ill in California, and his only son had been murdered two days before. I sat dazed and bewildered. The children's money was gone. That was bad enough, though I had plenty, if they would let me share. But Gertrude's grief was beyond any power of mine to comfort. The man she had chosen stood accused of a colossal embezzlement, and even worse, for in the instant that I sat there, I seemed to see the coils closing around John Bailey as the murderer of Arnold Armstrong. Gertrude lifted her head at last and stared across the table at Halsey. Why did he do it? she wailed. Couldn't you stop him, Halsey? It was suicide to go back. Halsey was looking steadily through the windows of the breakfast room, but it was evident he saw nothing. It was the only thing he could do, Trude, he said at last. Aunt Ray, when I found Jack at the Greenwood Club last Saturday night, he was frantic. I cannot talk until Jack tells me I may, but he is absolutely innocent of all this, believe me. I thought, Trude and I thought, we were helping him, but it was the wrong way. He came back. Isn't that the act of an innocent man? <clears throat> then why did he leave at all? I asked, unconvinced. What innocent man would run away from here at three o'clock in the morning? Doesn't it look rather as though he thought it impossible to escape? Gertrude rose angrily. You are not even just, she flamed. You don't know anything about it, and you condemn him. I know that we have all lost a great deal of money, I said. I shall believe Mr. Bailey innocent the moment he is shown to be. You profess to know the truth, but you cannot tell me. What am I to think? Halsey leaned over and patted my hand. You must take us on faith, he said. Jack Bailey hasn't a penny that doesn't belong to him. The guilty man will be known in a day or so. I shall believe that when it is proved, I said grimly. In the meantime, I take no one on faith. The innocents never do. Gertrude, who had been standing aloof at a window, turned suddenly. But when the bonds are offered for sale, Halsey, won't the thief be determined at once? Halsey turned with a superior smile. It wouldn't be done that way, he said. They would be taken out of the vault by someone who had access to it, and used as collateral for a loan in another bank. It would be possible to realize eighty per cent of their face value. In cash? In cash. But the man who did it, he would be known? Yes. I tell you both, as sure as I stand here, I believe that Paul Armstrong looted his own bank. I believe he has a million, at least, as the result, and that he will never come back. I'm worse than a pauper now. I can't ask Louise to share nothing a year with me, and when I think of this disgrace for her, I'm crazy. The most ordinary events of life seemed pregnant with possibilities that day, and when Halsey was called to the telephone, I ceased all pretense at eating. When he came back from the telephone, his face showed that something had occurred. He waited, however, until Thomas left the dining room, 
Then he told us. Paul Armstrong is dead, he announced gravely. He died this morning in California. Whatever he did, he is beyond the law now. Gertrude turned pale. And the only man who could have cleared Jack can never do it, she said despairingly. Also, I replied coldly, Mr. Armstrong is forever beyond the power of defending himself. When your Jack comes to me with some two hundred thousand dollars in his hands, which is about what you have lost, I shall believe him innocent. Halsey threw his cigarette away and turned on me. There you go, he exclaimed. If he was the thief, he could return the money, of course. If he is innocent, he probably hasn't a tenth of that amount in the world. In his hands. That's like a woman. Gertrude, who had been pale and despairing during the early part of the conversation, had flushed an indignant red. She got up and drew herself to her slender height, looking down at me with the scorn of one young and positive. "'You are the only mother I ever had,' she said tensely. "'I have given you all I would have given my mother had she lived, my love, my trust. And now, when I need you most, you fail me. I tell you, John Bailey is a good man, an honest man. If you say he is not, you—you—' you, Gertrude, Halsey broke in sharply. She dropped beside the table and, burying her face in her arms, broke into a storm of tears. I love him. I love him, she sobbed in a surrender that was totally unlike her. Oh, I never thought it would be like this. I can't bear it. I can't. Halsey and I stood helpless before the storm. I would have tried to comfort her, but she had put me away and there was something aloof in her grief, something new and strange. At last, when her sorrow had subsided to the dry, shaking sobs of a tired child, without raising her head, she put out one groping hand. Aunt Ray, she whispered. In a moment I was on my knees beside her, her arm around my neck, her cheek against my hair. Where am I in this? Halsey said suddenly, and tried to put his arms around us both. It was a welcome distraction, and Gertrude was soon herself again. The little storm had cleared the air. Nevertheless, my opinion remained unchanged. There was much to be cleared up before I would consent to any renewal of my acquaintance with John Bailey. And Halsey and Gertrude knew it, knowing me. <clears throat> Chapter 11 Halsey Makes a Capture It was about half past eight when we left the dining room, and still engrossed with one subject, the failure of the bank and its attendant evils, Halsey and I went out into the grounds for a stroll. Gertrude followed us shortly. The light was thickening, to appropriate Shakespeare's description of twilight, and once again the tree toads and the crickets were making night throb with their tiny life. It was almost oppressively lonely, in spite of its beauty, and I felt a sickening pang of homelessness for my city at night, for the clatter of horses' feet on cemented paving, for the lights, the voices, the sound of children playing. The country after dark oppresses me. The stars, quite eclipsed in the city by the electric lights, here become insistent, assertive. Whether I was to or not, I find myself looking for the few I know by name, and feeling ridiculously new and small by contrast. Always an unpleasant sensation. <clears throat> after Gertrude joined us, we avoided any further mention of the murder. To Halsey, as to me, there was ever present, I am sure, the thought of our conversation of the night before. As we strolled back and forth along the drive, Mr. Jamieson emerged from the shadow of the trees. Good evening, he said, 
managing to include Gertrude in his bow. Gertrude had never been ordinarily courteous to him, and she nodded coldly. Halsey, however, was more cordial, although we were all constrained enough. He and Gertrude went on together, leaving the detective to walk with me. As soon as they were out of earshot, he turned to me. "'Do you know, Miss Innes,' he said, "'the deeper I go into this thing, the more strange it seems to me. "'I am very sorry for Miss Gertrude. "'It looks as if Bailey, whom she has tried so hard to save, "'is worse than a rascal, and after her plucky fight for him, it seems hard.' I looked through the dust to where Gertrude's light dinner dress gleamed among the trees. She had made a plucky fight, poor child. Whatever she might have been driven to do, I could find nothing but a deep sympathy for her. If she had only come to me with the whole truth then. Miss Innes, Mr. Jamieson was saying, in the last three days, have you seen a... Any suspicious figures around the grounds? Any woman? No, I replied. I have a house full of maids that will bear watching, one and all. But there has been no strange woman near the house, or Liddy would have seen her, you may be sure. She has a telescopic eye. Mr. Jamieson looked thoughtful. It may not amount to anything, he said slowly. It is difficult to get any perspective on things around here, because every one down in the village is sure he saw the murderer either before or since the crime, and half of them will stretch a point or two as to facts to be obliging. But the man who drives the hack down there tells a story that may possibly prove to be important. I have heard it, I think. Was it the one the parlour-maid brought up yesterday, about a ghost wringing its hands on the roof? Or perhaps it's the one the milk-boy heard, a tramp washing a dirty shirt, presumably bloody, in the creek below the bridge. I could see the gleam of Mr. Jamieson's teeth as he smiled. <laughs> Neither, he said, but Matthew Geist, which is our friend's name, claims that on Saturday night, at nine-thirty, a veiled lady. I knew it would be a veiled lady, I broke in. A veiled lady, he persisted, who was apparently young and beautiful, engaged his hack and asked to be driven to Sunnyside. Near the gate, however, she made him stop, in spite of his remonstrances, saying she preferred to walk to the house. She paid him, and he left her there. Now, Miss Innes, you had no such visitor, I believe. No, I said decidedly. Geist thought it might be a maid, as you had got a supply that day. But he said her getting out near the gate puzzled him. Anyhow, we have now one veiled lady, who, with the ghostly intruder of Friday night, makes two assets that I hardly know what to do with. It is mystifying, I admitted, although I can think of one possible explanation. The path from the Greenwood Club to the village enters the road near the lodge gate. A woman who wished to reach the country club, unperceived, might choose such a method. There are plenty of women there. <coughs> I think this gave him something to ponder for in a short time he had said good-night and left. But I myself was far from satisfied. I was determined, however, on one thing. If my suspicions, for I had suspicions, were true, I would make my own investigations, and Mr. Jamieson should learn only what was good for him to know. We went back to the house, and Gertrude, who was more like herself since her talk with Halsey, sat down at the mahogany desk in the living room to write a letter. Halsey prowled up and down the entire east wing, now in the card room, now in the billiard room, and now and then blowing his clouds of tobacco smoke around among the pink and gold 
hangings of the drawing-room. After a little, I joined him in the billiard-room, and together we went over the details of the discovery of the body. The card-room was quite dark. Where we sat, in the billiard-room, only one of the side brackets was lighted, and we spoke in subdued tones, as the hour and the subject seemed to demand. When I spoke of the figure Liddy and I had seen on the porch through the card-room window Friday night, Halsey sauntered into the darkened room, and together we stood there, much as Liddy and I had done the other night. The window was the same grayish rectangle in the blackness as before. A few feet away, in the hall, was the spot where the body of Arnold Armstrong had been found. I was a bit nervous, and I put my hand on Halsey's sleeve. Suddenly, from the top of the staircase above us came the sound of a cautious footstep. At first I was not sure, but Halsey's attitude told me he had heard and was listening. The step, slow, measured, infinitely cautious, was nearer now. Halsey tried to loosen my fingers, but I was in a paralysis of fright. The swish of a body against the curving rail, as if for guidance, was plain enough, and now whoever it was had reached the foot of the staircase, and had caught a glimpse of our rigid silhouettes against the billiard-room doorway. Halsey threw me off then and strode forward. "'Who is it?' he called imperiously, and took a half-dozen rapid strides toward the foot of the staircase. Then I heard him mutter something. There was the crash of a falling body, the slam of the outer door, and, for an instant, quiet. I screamed, I think. Then I remember turning on the light and finding Halsey, white with fury, trying to untangle himself from something warm and fleecy. He had a cut on his forehead, a little on the lowest step of the stairs, and he was rather a ghastly sight. He flung the white object at me, and jerky open the outer door, raced into the darkness. Gertrude had come on hearing the noise, and now we stood, staring at each other over, of all things on earth, a white silk and wool blanket, exquisitely fine. It was the most unghostly thing in the world, with its lavender border and its faint scent. Gertrude was the first to speak. Somebody had it, she asked. Yes. Halsey tried to stop whoever it was and fell. Gertrude, that blanket is not mine. I have never seen it before. She held it up and looked at it. Then she went to the door, onto the veranda, and threw it open. Perhaps a hundred feet from the house were two figures that moved slowly towards us as we looked. When they came within range of the light, I recognized Halsey, and with him, Mrs. Watson, the housekeeper. And I think that's rather a good place to stop for the night. Made it through a couple of chapters. Yeah, this book continues to be interesting. The mystery continues to get more complicated. Mm -hmm. I can safely say I have no idea who did it. I don't think they've given us enough clues to figure it out yet. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm. Well, it being quite late, I suppose I should find somebody for us to raid. But, yeah, I appreciate everybody being here. And first, to give you an idea of what's coming up, on tomorrow evening, we'll continue the Blackwell Deception and hopefully finish it tomorrow. I don't know. This one does seem longer than the first three games, but still, this will be our third stream of it. I mean, one hand, I want to finish it and then move on to the last game, and on the other hand, I'm like, uh, what's the hurry? I'm enjoying myself. Then, uh, 
I'll see if I can do a makeup short horror stream uh, some night this week since I missed today. Possibly Monday or Tuesday. Yeah, it depends on a lot of things. And then Wednesday we'll continue Leather Goddesses of Phobos. Don't know that we'll finish it. Hey Doji Lon. Welcome in. Thanks for hanging out. <clears throat> and then we'll have more short horror Saturday next week. Maybe next Saturday I'll try and play that uh um free horror game I discovered that's uh an early effort by the uh, founder of Wadget Eye Games and is basically a prototype for the Blackwell series. It's called Bestowers of Eternity. It'll be fun to see similarities and differences between the actual series that then came about. <laughs> um, yeah, that's what's coming up. Maybe and maybe sometime the following week, another circular staircase stream. Who knows? Okay, who's on the line? since we rated him, hasn't it? Let's see. Yeah, we rated her not long ago. Is he playing? Hmm. Oh, well. Boozle's playing King Quest Quest 4. Yeah. I feel like we raided Techie Rob not that long ago, but we don't we don't, we don't get to raid him that often. Yeah, let's go raid Techie Rob. He's playing Beautiful Joe on GameCube. I think he's trying to finish it tonight. Hmm. <clears throat> Or whatever. I can type. Yeah. Substituting uh, numbers for letters in that name. <laughs> uh, thank you guys again for coming to hang out with me. Whether you're chatting or lurking, I appreciate you being here. And you can find me on Twitter and MySpace, where I post stream announcements and polls and other random things and yeah, Twitter more than MySpace and you can find VODs of my past streams on YouTube yeah. but I hope everybody has a good night don't lie awake in bed trying to solve the mystery of the circular staircase we'll get there eventually but, yeah. say hi to Techie Rob, and I'll see you guys tomorrow for more Rosa Blackwell and Joey Malone. <laughs>